Are we ready, Benjamin? I think we are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Taryn McKenna. I'm the Pines Program Manager for Georgia Public Library Service. And it is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the 2020 online Evergreen International Conference. As I'm sure most of you know, we were originally scheduled to hold the 2020 conference here in Atlanta in April. And all of us at Pines were very excited about bringing the conference home to where Evergreen began. When COVID-19 hit, the conference committee and the board of the Evergreen Project were forced to make the difficult decision to cancel the conference. I think I can speak for the entire conference committee in saying that we were crushed as we'd worked so hard on the conference planning for this year. But thanks to the wonderful pitch in and get it done attitude of the Evergreen community with a charge led by Andrea Bunce Nyman and the Evergreen Outreach Committee, the conference was revamped as this week's online conference. I would like to express my deepest thanks to everyone who stepped up to the challenge. Galen Charlton of Equinox Open Library Initiative, Ruth Frazier of Indiana State Library, Ron Gignan of Noble, Rogan Hamby of Equinox Open Library Initiative, Debbie Lukenbill of Mobius, Andrea Bunce Nyman of Equinox Open Library Initiative, and Amy Terlega of Bibliomation. Normally, this is the time when I would encourage everyone to stand up and give them the standing ovation they deserve for pulling this off, but please express your thanks in chat. <clears throat> I would also like to thank all of the presenters who agreed to convert their previously planned presentations to the online format. And of course, to the sponsors who provided the technology to make this possible. Bibliomation, Evergreen Indiana Library Consortium, Mobius, and NC Cardinal sponsored access to Zoom for the streaming and recording. And Equinox Open Library Initiative, initiative excuse me, sponsored live captioning in order to make these sessions more accessible to everyone. The contributions of these sponsors have not only made it possible for this conference to happen and to be available to a broader base of Evergreen users who might not have been able to travel to Atlanta in the first place, but also to be free of charge. Again, virtual applause time. Thank you and um, thank your sponsors. I would also like to express my gratitude to the Crown Plaza Ravinia for making it possible for us to cancel the Atlanta conference without taking a crippling financial loss and to the conference and meeting services of the Board of Regents of the University, University System of Georgia for managing all of the contract paperwork and handling the refunds to the registered attendees, exhibitors and sponsors. And also, Thank you to all of you, the Evergreen users and developers for creating a community that we can all be proud to be part of. The world today is very different from what we thought it was going to be a year ago. Most of us have faced some level of turmoil and uncertainty, pain, grief, anger, frustration, fear, financial hardship, but libraries have always been there for their communities and that is no different now. Libraries are fundamentally open to everyone Yet we've been in a situation where we've been required to close our doors to the public for our greater good. This goes against everything we've always stood for. Thankfully, we now live in a time where we can leverage technology in order to continue serving our communities. I marvel at how much flexibility the Evergreen software already has to adjust to circumstances that change from day to day. And I'm impressed by how quickly movement has been made on developing new features, such as the curbside pickup feature. I feel confident that we will continue to move forward and that Evergreen will continue to grow and improve to meet whatever challenges get thrown at us. At this time, I'd like to invite Andrea Bunce Nyman to speak about how our libraries are using the Evergreen software to continue to provide support to their patrons at this time. Thanks, Taryn. And um, good morning, afternoon, everyone, depending on, on where you are. So, uh, on behalf of the Evergreen Outreach Committee, it's uh, my privilege to give the 2020 community update. Um, as Tara noted, uh, and as other communities have worldwide, we, the Evergreen community, have been shaken and uh, risen up in response to the pandemic. As you know, um, the in-person conference scheduled had to be canceled, which was a heartbreaking outcome for the uh, year's worth of work uh, on behalf of the conference committee. Um, but the community rallied, um, the outreach committee, which I'm a part of building on this work from the conference committee, managed to pull together this online conference that you're now attending. 
Um, this was a true community act. The Evergreen Board, the conference committee, our presenters, hosts, sponsors, captioners, attendees, um, all of you made this happen. And I am personally so grateful um, to all of you for collectively coming along on this, uh, this highly experimental ride. If uh, this first of its kind Evergreen Online Conference is a success, it is because of all of you, so thank you. There are other tales uh, in our community of Evergreen community members rallying in the face of unprecedented circumstances. And I'm gonna share a couple specific stories here. Jessica Wolford at Bibliomation um, shared her tale of speeding access to digital services. Quote, we had many libraries set up the self-registration feature in Evergreen for the first time. Thanks to the help of some community members, we were able to add card numbers to our welcome emails so that patrons could start using electronic services right away once staff registered their pending accounts. Diane Disbro at Scenic Regional Library told me um, about how her library used user buckets to extend account expiration dates several times, as it turned out, and moved due dates using emergency closing handler. They also turned off their overdue and expiration notices, and like Bibliomation, they kept up with their pending patron list so that patrons could use online resources. Uh, Taryn McKenna at Pines told me about how they had to store almost 20,000 items in warehouses when courier service was suspended. Some libraries, however, continued to do limited uh, local curbside pickup. And to support this, Pines marked those libraries closed, but leveraged a library setting at those branches to enable local hold targeting and pickup. Now that most libraries have staff back on site, the courier has started up again. Many libraries are still using closed dates to prevent fine accrual and push out due dates, so Pines is leveraging another library setting to accommodate this new workflow. On the service provider side, uh, my colleague Stephen Callender, who is Equinox's support manager, came up with a clever way to allow libraries to use uh, local holds to prevent transits without tinkering with a lot of complex consortial holds policies. He created a set of age hold protect rules that put 100 years of age protection on local items. So there is one rule that will keep these items strictly within a branch um, if they're less than 100 years old, which they all are. And then another rule to keep items within a local system if systems would rather use that. He also created some custom action trigger templates to allow libraries to quickly send batch emails to any patron with an email address to keep them updated about constantly changing uh, library hours and procedures. So those are just a really small example of the stories that, that people have shared with me. I'm sure that you all have similar stories from all of your organizations. Uh, the common threads in all these stories are adaptability, flexibility, creativity, and collaboration in response to wildly unforeseen circumstances. 2020 has been a challenging year uh, so far for all of us, but as always, the Evergreen community has responded as best we can to support our libraries, our patrons, and each other. Uh, I really hope we see everyone again in person in 2021, and thank you for making this community the amazing place that it is. Thank you so much, Andrea. Over the next three days, we will talk about accessibility and usability, cataloging, developing custom reports, contributing to Evergreen documentation, customizing user permissions, Evergreen software development, setting up automated notifications and processes with action triggers, and so much more. There are two tracks of sessions each day, but they will all be recorded and made available on the conference website if you are unable to attend the sessions you wish to. Our keynote session will begin at 1 p.m. But before that, I wanna say once more, welcome. I miss your faces and the hallway conversations, the dinners and the game nights, but I'm so glad to see you here online. Thank you and have a wonderful conference.
Okay, so it's one o'clock on the hour. John, are you, you ready for us to get, get going? I sure am, yep. Okay, so um, uh, I'm gonna do an introduction, but John's gonna be running my slides, so I hope it's not too weird that I'm telling him next <laughs> consistently. Um, good afternoon, I'm Elizabeth McKinney. I'm the director of Pines, and I'm here to introduce our speaker this afternoon. So this is a bit of an extended introduction, so just bear with me. I'll, you won't have to listen to me all hour. Um, even though John's not active within the Evergreen Community Channels, he's been a contributor to the Evergreen Community for a few years now. Um, more on that in just a moment. Uh, John is a User Experience Information and Communications Technology Quality Assurance Manager at the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation, also known as CIDI, at Georgia Tech. He oversees digital accessibility and user experience initiatives for higher ed institutions, nonprofits, and under other industries across the country. He has worked in the industry for many years and has also published widely. In a conference full of librarians and, and software developers, I would like to tell you something that will make you even more comfortable with John. So next. John is a cat person and this is his newly adopted uh, baby named Cotton. Uh, next. So now to tell you about his experience with Evergreen. Um, the Georgia Public Library Service has several units. Pines is one of our flagship programs and another of our flag flagship programs is uh, the Georgia Library for Accessible Services, also known as GLASS. Both programs serve everyone who lives, works, goes to school, or owns property in the state of Georgia. GLASS promotes the use of assistive technology and accessible reading materials for those who are blind or whose physical abilities require the use of books and magazines in audio format or in braille. The library provides materials from the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, also known as NLS, and allows users who are unable to visit a library to obtain materials uh, freely by mail. Patrons registered with GLASS are able to borrow from the Pine statewide collection too. This includes large print, DVDs with descriptive tracks, audiobook, sound recording, and other AV materials. So we have patrons with the NLS defined disabilities accessing our public catalog. The Glass Office and Library in Atlanta is a Pines Library and they participate in the statewide consortium as well. The library employs uh, several people who qualify for NLS services, so accessibility is crucial for their use of the Evergreen staff client. Next. So this is where John comes in. He and his team at CIDI were generous to provide accessibility studies via ADA grants for our office. The first study was done in April of 2017, and they reviewed the public catalog. The second study was done in July of 2019, and they reviewed the web client. Next. So this is a list of all of the open tickets, uh, the things that we submitted after our accessibility studies. On this slide, there are 22 confirmed, 10 undecided, one wish list, and one pull request. Eight of these are for OPAC and 29 for staff client. Next. And this is a list of all 24 entries that have been fixed. Four of these are for OPAC and 20 for the staff client. Next. And so um, Ather Sharif was our keynote speaker last year. He concluded his talk by asking, when you write one line of code, are you okay that one day in your senior life you may not be able to use your own product? And what can you do to improve accessibility? So uh, without further ado, I give you John Rimple to continue this discussion. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth surprised me the other day by uh, asking if she could put that, that kitten slide up there and uh, uh, that's fine. <laughs> uh, we've all made changes uh, during COVID-19 and that's one of my major changes. Uh, I thought that it would give me ample time to train her, and uh, I think the uh, the reverse is true. She's training me really well. And John, just as uh, just to in interject just a wee bit, you got plenty of Oz and super cutes on that. So just so you know, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep watching the chat for you. Okay, thank you, and hey, th thank you all for for attending. It's a very busy time for for most of us, and we are all probably maxed out as far as online. Uh, meetings and whatnot. So really appreciate the time that everyone is, is putting into. But 
for those who didn't hear the opening remarks, thank you also to the Evergreen community for making this happen. This is a, a tremendous undertaking to transfer from a physical conference to a, to a virtual. So thank you to the, to the tireless efforts of the team. And thank you to Elizabeth for all the initiatives she's taken toward accessibility with her and her team. And I'll be getting into that a little bit more uh, in a little, little while. You'll probably forget some or a lot of what I'm going to be discussing. Uh, and, and I wouldn't be offended, that's just the nature of it. But if there is one thing that you can take away from this keynote, it is this first statement here, nothing about us without us. We're living in some very, as, as mentioned with some of the opening comments, some very uh, unprecedented times now with the coronavirus and the majority of us at least partially telecommuting. So it's a stressful time for, for anyone. Um, and then with essentially what we're seeing with the a, with a rebirth of a civil rights movement underway, that, that is also uh, of, of great upheaval and change for, for likely all of us on, on some level. So nothing about us without us, achieving equal access for all. Um, Librarians know this language well. Librarians are equalizers. I mean, really, you're providing services to the public at, at uh, no cost and equalizing uh, access to information and education. So you, you all play an extremely important role uh, in uh, leveling the playing field for everyone. And as Elizabeth mentioned, I am going to talk about accessibility. And I'm going to start off first by defining what this, where this term came from, nothing about us without us. And it really didn't start off as a disability related uh, term. It's a Latin slogan used in the past to communicate the idea that no policy should be decided by any representative without the full and direct participation of members of the groups affected by that policy. The term in its English form came into use during the 1990s in the context of disability activism. So when we talk about uh, civil rights, we are really talking about accessibility rights as well. So accessibility is a human right for people with disabilities. And I have two photos up right now. The one on the left is a, a, are a number of individuals uh, uh, positioned in front of a bus. And this actually took place in Philadelphia. And uh, my director, Carolyn Phillips, actually knows the person who took this photo. What they're doing is blocking the bus because this is, this is pre-ADA, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. We take it for granted that everything is accessible uh, or, or a lot, a lot of uh, public access is more accessible. And even as, as uh, late as 1990, that there's large portions of uh, even public transportation and access that just were not there. The gentleman in the wheelchair has a sign on the back of his wheelchair saying, I can't even get to the back of the bus. Uh, it's a reference to uh, Rosa Parks, who, you know, and the, and the, and the movement of, um, you know, African Americans not having to go to the back of the bus when asked. And so this really correlates very, very closely with the civil rights movement. In fact, to the right here, we have a quote by Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So rather than marginalizing, separating, uh, disenfranchising, you, the, the, the model really has moved toward access for everyone. And first off, before I describe this picture, I will say uh, this is a, a photo at UGA, University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia here. And this was taken pre-ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, 1988. And I will say before I comment on this that uh, UGA is one of the leading higher ed institutions in the state of Georgia when it comes to accessibility. But this was more than 30 years ago. So this gentleman who uh, uses a wheelchair is illustrating his frustration by trying to climb up the stairs. 
And the quote here in the paper at the time, the Atlanta Constitution is, UGA freshman David Bliss, who usually travels by wheelchair, makes a graphic point by claiming the grant steps Sorry about that, this is a bit emotional for me. Uh, to the building that contains the school's handicapped services office, the building has no elevator. So you have individuals with disabilities trying to access what's, what was called then the uh, handicapped services. And then now it would be the disability services office. And you see the ludicrousy of, of the situation here where there's an office designed specifically for people with disabilities that that uh, can't access it. So I, I actually grew up in Canada and I remember a gentleman sharing with me that he worked for a larger company and he said he had heard his own colleagues say, why do we need wheelchair ramps? Uh, why do we need accessible elevators? We don't have people in wheelchairs coming to visit us. <laughs> and you know, intelligent, educated individuals who can't make this connection. So this is a physical barrier, clearly, but there are attitudinal barriers, digital barriers that, that continue to be in place. We've done better with the physical barriers, but we, we still have a, lot to, a long ways to go with the digital and attitudinal barriers. So this is where um, some of the services that we've offered to uh, Elizabeth and her team have come in. The ADA Coordinator's Office uh, of Georgia has uh, funded for several years, since 2012 actually, they've funded a, an initiative called Access GA. And what that allows us at Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Tech to do is to provide uh, training, uh, technical assistance, web accessibility evaluations to agencies like Pines. Uh, you know, uh, working closely with Georgia Technology Authority, working with uh, upwards of potentially 80 state agencies within Georgia. So we, we provide a, a wide variety of services under, under this initiative. And what's really powerful about this is it doesn't cost agencies additional funding to, to have this done. So very grateful that Elizabeth and her team took the information that we shared with them, took, them the, web, took the web audit and put it into practice and actually remediated as much as they were able to. Let me go back to this one more time though. I did wanna mention, Elizabeth and I were talking about this a couple days ago. It's not about building a perfectly accessible website. It's not about being accessible at all times. It's about putting forth a good faith effort. It's, it's virtually impossible to get it right every single time, but it's about building in processes. It's about uh, an attitudinal shift of continuing to be courageous, courageous enough to look at your content and, uh, you know, emphasis, determine that whether it is or accessible or not, making those necessary changes to, to make it accessible. People, especially in higher ed, are really stuck on that 100% or perfect. There is no perfect when it comes to accessibility. It's about a good faith effort. It's about sustainability. It's about putting in processes and mechanisms in place so that it will be as accessible as possible. So defining disability. This is one term by Joseph Shapiro. And this is a real attitudinal shift that has taken place in the last couple of decades, especially. Disability is not a medical problem. The problem is a built environment and the barriers that society puts up. It's not about the inability to move or to breathe without a ventilator. It's about the inability to get into a classroom. So it's really, really de defining uh, disability is not a medical issue, but more of an environmental access issue. Now with the CDC, which is local here to Atlanta, um, they estimate approximately one in four individuals, adults in the US are living with a disability. And that's, that is a huge number. Whether you're, whether you're looking at providing full access from, uh, you know, from an ethical standpoint, from a legal standpoint, this also is about market share. If, you're, if you are disenfranchising 25% of your potential customers, that's huge. 
So even from a profit revenue generating or market share standpoint, uh, creating accessibility is, is absolutely crucial. So the categories that they've listed here is uh, seeing, hearing, communication, reasoning, walking, and performing other basic life functions, one in four approximately. So we have made a lot of achievements. The big one, uh, you know, the legislation is the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. That really is considered one of the gold standards internationally. The US is, is very fortunate to have that. And other countries have to greater or lesser degrees tried to emulate that uh, just because it has been so successful. There are clearly barriers that, that continue to exist and we certainly have additional work that needs to be done both in the digital, digital re arena as well as the attitudinal uh, arena. So it's, it's, it is a monumental time that we live in now with the pandemic, with essentially the civil rights movement um, uh, coming about as, as we speak. Also with the ADA's 30th anniversary next month, this is um, signed into law back in 1990 by George H.W. Bush. And like I said, this has been a major game changer on so many different levels. So this is, and I, I'm happy to give Microsoft credit for this. This is, a, this is their inclusive uh, chart that they've created. And it's basically very simplified personas of disabilities. Uh, solve for one, extend to many. Back in the 90s and even before that, uh, it was very common, uh, and I'm thinking specifically with the digital content in the 90s, to make two environments, one for the quote unquote disabled person and one for the mainstream or uh, person that people that aren't disabled. This is a really a powerful chart here because it illustrates how when you make uh, technology, uh, products, services accessible for one population, you're making it accessible for, for a much broader population. And every single one of these with the coronavirus we live in now uh, is, is impacting most of us on one level or another. So the permanent one, let's start with touch. So obviously someone with one arm or ambulatory challenges is really going to need to have effective ability to reach um, full access, for example, buttons on an iPad, having it on the lower section of the, of the screen, making it a little easier to use. That's just one example. And then the temporary and situational examples are arm injury or uh, even being a new parent where you're holding a child. Well, in the coronavirus era we live in, you know, this may sound a little silly, but what if you have pets that are climbing all over your keyboard and you're struggling touching the, touching this, touching the keyboards? Um, uh, what if you are in a household where there are multiple people at home? Maybe you have uh, one or two children or more. Uh, your spouse might be at home as well and uh, you're having difficulties, um, you know, managing all that with, with uh, uh, you know, pets and cats <laughs> uh, uh, and, and children on your lap trying to, trying to use your keyboard seeing. So the obvious one permanently here would be blindness. And the examples here given are cataracts and distracted driver. Well, what if you, what if your situation at home is less than optimal? You have to carve out a corner of the house or move to a certain location where there might be glare. Uh, it might be next to a window where you can't control the lighting as much as you would like. Um, a lot of distractions with seeing, again, pets climbing up on your keyboard, uh, uh, potentially children uh, distracting you. Uh, hearing, so we can all relate to this. Uh, uh, the permanent disability is, is deafness. Um, and they've used the examples of ear infection and bartender. Well, uh, a friend of mine has complained for a number of years now about the leaf blowers during the day. And a lot of us can really empathize with him now because we're on that conference call. I'm a few feet away from a window where a leaf blower is blasting every single morning. And I have to be careful to mute myself and to 
let people know that there's a leaf blower. That's why they're, you know, their their hearing is compromised with even even being able to hear me. Plus, being able to hear them on the call is 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 very uh, very difficult as well. Um, and then when you're in a, a a fuller house where there's a lot of activity, obviously that's going to compromise your hearing. So you you get where I'm going here. Every single one of these disabilities is is likely impacting us on one level or another. Speaking again, that that same leaf blower could could be a potential issue. Uh, so a colleague and I, we presented uh, a webinar a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was a compromised uh, internet connection she had. Her father was using the the uh, the land the the uh, Ethernet line directly. She was relying on the Wi-Fi. So her ability to speak to the audience was really compromised. So every one of these we can not just sympathize with, but empathize with, with individuals who have a quote unquote disability. What isn't mentioned here is cognitive load, um, auditory fatigue. So there, with so much going on with the stress that we're under, we are probably not functioning at our optimum. And you think of someone with maybe a learning disability. Now you can begin to understand that someone with a learning disability, if you have a very active household or you're under a tremendous amount of stress, you are experiencing what some individuals may experience on a regular permanent basis. Decision, executive decision-making processes. Uh, creativity, for instance, is, is really stunted when you're under stress. So the ADA and accessible IT, keep in mind that the ADA was signed into law before the internet was even birthed. So the internet came into existence about six months after the ADA was signed into law back in 1990. And it's amazing how robust and forward thinking the ADA was. I think a lot of people assume that the ADA says, says quite a bit or at least something about assistive technology, information technology, digital accessibility. It really has absolutely no language in there. However, there are some broader concepts I'm going to get into that certainly uh, apply to the digital arena. So the ADA was never intended by disability advocates or policymakers to apply to information technology. Most information technology at the time was text-based and largely accessible. Some of you may be familiar with Tim Berners-Lee. He was the inventor of the internet. So only a few short months after the passage of the ADA, Tim Berners-Lee posted the first page on the World Wide Web in December 1990. And I can guarantee you it wasn't a pretty page, but it was likely functional. So the accessibility challenge. The exponential growth of the internet and IT not only sparked an e-commerce revolution, but an added challenge of making the new technologies accessible for people with disabilities. This is a, to the right, is a screenshot of uh, a, an old <laughs> uh, page uh, on the internet that is essentially just text and it's, it's essentially monochrome, just, just white on black, that's all there is to it. And this is a, a demonstration of what a screen reader would use. The most commonly, commonly used screen reader even today is called JAWS, Job Access with Speech and uh, it, which was released back in 1989. And the 90s was a bit of a heyday, believe it or not, for people who were blind accessing uh, digital content, especially the early 90s, because everything was text-based. Some of you, if you're probably upwards of 35 years old or older, you may remember uh, Microsoft uh, DOS and WordPerfect 5.1, for example, that was all uh, 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 directory driven, all sh shortcut key driven, keyboard driven. There was no GUI interface, uh, graphic user interface at that point. So blind people were, were really kind of at, on par with where uh, sighted people were as far as everything was keyboard driven but that radically changed with graphical user interface. 
So the standards engine, the engine that drives the ADA is standards. In the built environment, the ADA access guidelines tell architects and builders exactly what they need to do to make any building accessible. To the right, we have a, a gentleman uh, who is in a wheelchair going up a wheelchair ramp. And this is probably a lot more complex than it may initially appear. That ramp has a specific slope to it, an incline that is going to be ADA compliant. That ramp has a level of traction that's going to be functional for anyone using a wheelchair. And then you may also notice the little yellow bumps to the left and right of this gentleman's wheelchair. And those are for individuals who may be low vision, who uh, may accidentally uh, veer off on that, on that uh, ramp. So there's a lot of components that go into this. And the ADA and the standards and guidelines have done really well with the physical environment, but not so well with the virtual uh, digital environment. So lack of standards, just as no one thought about access to information technology when the ADA was passed, no one thought about how anyone would develop standards for accessibility for information technology. It wasn't even really in existence back then. I thought you might find this of interest. This is Georgia Tech's website back in 1996. And as, as if, if any of you used the internet back then, you'll be quite familiar with the plain Jane sort of look to this. It's got some text, it's got hyperlinks, and it's got a couple of graphics. But I wanna point out one other thing. Uh, below the, the Georgia Tech logo, you have text only page. This was very common in the 90s where you would have a separate page dedicated only for people with disabilities they would strip it of the graphics, any, any sort of aesthetic um, uh, pleasure of the page was stripped and it was just bare bones. And it caused a lot of challenges because now a, a company or a higher ed institution or any organization would have to maintain two websites, the mainstream website and then the quote unquote uh, special website for people with disabilities. So what would happen inevitably is the uh, text only page would no longer be pertinent, updated, um, and sometimes not even accessible. So it was a, it was a, an attempt to make it accessible for individuals with disabilities. But this is where universal design and design for all comes in that has really taken off in, in recent decades is you design it once, you design it as robust and as flexible and versatile as possible so that everyone can use it. Because throughout our life cycle, we are going to have a disability, a permanent disability, most likely, whether it's uh, compromised vision, compromised hearing, uh, hand tremors, um, you know, our cognition, uh, our memory loss, as we get older, we're, we're just going to not have as much capacity to remember information like we did when we were 20, for instance. So really designing for one, uh, you know, one system for, for all users is the way to go. I understand there are some uh, obvious uh, drawbacks to that. Not everything is gonna work for everyone, but does using universal design principles for that type of methodology and build out is really going to save a lot of headaches for everyone. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I, I could not talk about the ADA without talking about the sec section 504. This was a bill that was assigned into law in 1973. It's a civil rights law impacting education programs and activities. Section 504 was historic because for the first time, people with disabilities were viewed as a class, a minority group. Previously, public, public policy had been characterized by addressing the needs of particular disabilities by category based on diagnosis. And then the US Access Board is a pretty important body. It's, it's not a huge group of people, actually. It's less than 50 people, I think 
potentially even less than 20. But the work they do is really important. An independent agency of the United States government devoted to accessibility for people with disabilities. The US Access Board established the Section 508 standards, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with, that implement the law and provides the requirements for accessibility. Section 508 requires federal agencies to make their ICT, such as technology, online training, and website, websites accessible for everyone. The idea here was that Section 508 was to be uh, mandated for uh, federal uh, agencies and those who do contract work for federal agencies and, and in some instances receive federal uh, funds. And the hope was that this would trickle down into the rest of the economy uh, to state agencies, to nonprofits, to for profits. In Europe, this model has been much more successful, but for whatever reason in the US, it, it hasn't had that, that, that trickle down uh, effect on other organizations to be more accessible. Section 508, in 1998, Congress passed Section 508 requiring federal websites, contractors, and those receiving funding under the AT Act, that stands for Assistive Technology Act, to meet accessibility standards. Many of you have likely heard of the, the WCAG, that stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And this was in its infancy, uh, WCAG 1.0. Obviously, there's going to be a tremendous amount of aging to this. It was uh, 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 finalized in 1999. And again, Tim Berners-Lee comes up, the inventor of the internet. The World Wide Web Consortium, an industry group led by Tim Berners-Lee developed the most widely used set of standards for online accessibility, version one. The challenge with this is, was it was very device and um, computer specific and also software specific. Version two, which came out in 2009, and this is still very old if you think of it, but version two, two uh, WCAG 2.0 is, is still surprisingly robust, even, even today. And it's uh, it, it built in much needed updates. The real key difference here between 1.0 and 2.0 is that they tried to make it device agnostic, which means that you should be able to use any browser, you should be able to use, um, you know, go to one website or another and it, it shouldn't impact the person's experience. A person can use JAWS, for instance, a screen reader, or NVDA, non-visual desktop access, voiceover, and it should theoretically have the same experience. And it, it doesn't always, but to a large degree, that has been accomplished. 2.1, people get a little confused with this. They think they are so far behind the times if they're only doing 2.0 and they really need to get on to 2.1. I'm not saying 2.1 isn't really important, but 2.1 is a was a relatively um, minor update um, to 2.0. It addresses mobile devices. And certainly mobile devices could have been addressed with WCAG 2.0 previously, which, which they have been, but certainly not to the degree and the, the current state that mobile devices are in. Keep in mind, the iPhone was only rolled out in 2007. So uh, that's how quickly, if, if you think of it, that was 13 years ago, that's how rapidly technology has changed. Um, and then the other piece of it with 2.1 is, is a continuation of guidelines related to low vision and cognitive needs as well. You're gonna hear WCAG 3.0, hopefully in the near future, um, related to continued techn technological updates as well. Uh, they, may, they may call it WCAG 3.0 or they may go with another naming convention. I don't think it's really been determined yet. How does the ADA apply to the internet? So again, this is where a lot of confusion take, takes place. Like I said earlier, the ADA was in place before the internet was even birthed. But these are some areas that it actually has some teeth to. Title I of the ADA requires employers to make reasonable accommodations for job seekers with disabilities. So this could, and underlined could, include making online job applications and career websites accessible. This is where so often these cases that go to 
go to a, a, a judge or a panel are very um, open to interpretation to say the least. So it depends on, depends on how a person uh, defines um, reasonable accommodations and accessibility. Title II, this is, uh, requires that state and local governments provide, quote, program access for people with disabilities. Again, another area that it can potentially be open to interpretation. If state and local government websites are a program, it could be argued that they would need to be accessible, absent and undue burden. So I wanted to mention here, one of the, one of the, call, one of the frequent calls I get from whether it's for-profit or state agencies or nonprofit, is what do we need to do to be ADA compliant? And I don't think a lot of the people who ask that question fully understand what they're, what they're asking. The ADA can be applied to digital, uh, digital access and it has been applied effectively, but because it's also open to interpretation and there are a lack of standards and guidelines in place with, with actually legislative teeth to them, what we what we recommend, and again, it goes back to um, including people with disabilities in that process, is if you want to ensure that it's accessible, pull people with disabilities into the planning, into the development, into the design stages of whatever you're creating. And again, I'll, I'll give Elizabeth and her team kudos here because that's exactly what they've done with, with Glass, is they've reached out and Elizabeth has informed me the developers have actually reached out to individuals with disabilities saying, can you test this? You know, how can we improve this? Because you're not really accomplishing full accessibility unless you're including the people with the disabilities at the table. Title three. So this is where a lot of the lawsuits that you hear are fall under. Title three of the ADA states that places of public accommodation shall be accessible. A great deal of time and energy has been devoted to defining quote unquote place. One of the, one of the recent uh, lawsuits that you probably heard of that reached, went all the way back to the Supreme Court and was pushed back was the Domino's uh, pizza case. So their website was not accessible. Their app was not accessible. And the argument that their attorneys made was, well, can't they just pick up the phone and call? So again, it goes back to that 1990s model of why don't we just make a separate, uh, a, you know, plain text page for the people with disabilities and cut them out of the other, um, you know, the other experience that we that we uh, provide to the general public. Again, if you have a website that's offering discounts, that's offering coupons that could potentially be promoting uh, certain certain pizzas, for instance, in, in that case with Domino's Pizza, individuals with disabilities are still being cut out. So um, I'll give you a concrete example here as well. Uh, CIDI, we launched a MOOC, it's called a uh, Massive Open Online Course, which probably a lot of you are familiar with. And it was specifically on the topic of accessibility. We explored different um, platforms, uh, edX, Coursera. Um, uh, there were a couple of others that we were looking at and none of them were accessible and it would have been hypocritical for us to have launched a massive open online course on a platform that wasn't accessible. At that time, Harvard and MIT was actually facing a, a lawsuit. Uh, so they, they use the, the edX, they've actually designed the edX platform, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And I was testing it, that platform at the time. One week after another, the, the platform became more and more accessible. And at, at the end of the day, we, we decided to just launch on edX because it was by far the most accessible platform that we could find. And it was one of the, an extremely rewarding experience to speak to someone who was blind, had no vision at all, who spoke to me about being able to access our massive open online course fully without any barriers using his screen reader. And I, I give a lot, a lot of credit to our previous uh, pre, uh, executive director who decided to put a hold on launching that 
until uh, edX became more accessible. So that's just one concrete example of how this can be achieved. You know, if Harvard and MIT had were were more forward thinking, and I'll give the Pines, um, you know, folks some a lot of credit here. They're being proactive. Again, it's about um, you know. Um, um, putting your best foot forward and making a good faith effort to make it as accessible as possible. They could have easily done that ahead of time rather than being sort of forced to have done, done that. Um, ICT refresh. So this is the update to section 508. Uh, again, the US Access Board final rule published January of 18, January 18th, 2017, pretty recently. And then there was a uh, safe harbor for about a year and a half, but legacy ICT that has not been altered after compliance date uh, was not required to be to be changed. And again, they take into consideration an undue burden. If you're a small organization and it's going to cost a substantial amount of money to make your content accessible, they take that into consideration. If you're a Microsoft or Apple, you, you kind of have to have your <laughs> you have to have your um, your ducks in a row because those companies can more easily afford um, you know making it a, a, as accessible as possible uh, in a shorter period of time. So ICT refresh, also known as Section 508 refresh, and and or WCAG adoption. So although there is still a lack of regulations and standards. There's a lot of organizations that are moving toward adopting Section 508 Refresh and or WCAG uh, 2.0 and some now 2.1 as their standard. A couple of examples are Georgia Tech and Georgia Technology Authority, GTA here in Georgia. Doesn't mean we're perfect by no means, but we, like I said, we're putting a good faith effort in and, uh, you know, a. Um, um, having that um, uh, that standard in place is going to be give it some teeth and to know uh, let people know what they're actually striving toward. So cultural and attitudinal shifts needed, not just bite-sized shifts. Bite is in B-Y-T-E, a little cheeky there. But this is really where the change needs to take place. Yes, there are technological changes that need to be take place. But to incorporate uh, best practice, to incorporate uh, longevity uh, and uh, sustainability with the content, it's really important to have those cultural and attitudinal shifts. And I, I think of the, you know, the current civil rights movement essentially that we're living in now, you know, the, there may be some laws that change, there may be some policies that change, but again, it's the attitude, it's the culture that changes that. Uh, the, the other components to that, and let's bring it back into the digital arena, the digital stuff is actually relatively easy. It's the cultural and attitudinal shifts toward people with disabilities and what they can accomplish and what they can do with the right tools and the level uh, playing field. That's, that's really the hard piece that, that is the challenging component to this. And I'm looking at my time here, 143, so close to wrapping this up. I wanted to give Lainey Feingold a shout out here. She is, um, I've, I've attended several conferences with her. She is one of the leading subject matter experts when it comes to digital accessibility and, uh, and leveling the playing field. And she has introduced a very unique structure called structured negotiation. This is a collaborative and solution driven dispute resolution method, typically conducted without a lawsuit on file. So really the, the, the premise behind this is reach out to people with disabilities, reach out to the uh, individuals who, um, you know, you think may not be able to access your content without some input. You know, similar to what Elizabeth and her team have done with other individuals in the community that happen to have disabilities, get their input and get it in as, as early as possible in the design stage, in the development stage. You know, it's these retrofits after a website or application has been uh, developed are 
time consuming, very expensive. And again, you're building in universal design that is essentially going to make a website or an application more accessible for everyone, regardless of whether they have a quote unquote disability or not. So again, um, including folks with disabilities, these are some, some, some basic uh, uh, points I wanted to leave you with. Establish basic understanding of disabilities. We are not expecting you to be a disability specialist by any means, but there are a lot of resources and Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation. We have, we have a lot of videos demonstrating how people with disabilities access content. So familiarize yourself with that. Reach out to the disability community. For example, if you're in a city that has a blindness organization, reach out to them, ask them, you know, can we get your input on this? Is this, is this accessible? Um, the deaf and hard of hearing community, start cultivating those relationships and letting them teach you on what they need. Because I, I'll tell you, they, they know the impact that they can make. And um, it's an impact that I feel, I, I'm actually legally blind myself. I have a, a lot of functional vision, but my vision is such where, it's one of the reasons why I don't have my camera on is I'm, I'm basically a couple inches away from a 22 inch monitor here, but it doesn't slow me down. Um, and these are the kind of things that the disability community is going to give you at, in, insights into. So include impl implementation at the earliest stages don't wait until you've rolled out that website and run some automated testing tools on it and think, okay, it's, it's, it's great now. Pull the people with disabilities in at the earliest stage possible, just like anyone uh, with that UX testing, not just people with disabilities, but the general public, get them, get buy-in from them. If you're simply relying on your development team, they're focusing on, you know, the mechanics of it, they're not necessarily focusing on the usability of it, the accessibility of it. And then carefully consider input. I see this a lot, people with disabilities, you know, you can have one person with a disability have a megaphone and appear to represent all people with disabilities. I would just caution you on that. Get a, get a range of people uh, with disabilities to provide input uh, to your content. So that just like with people without disabilities, we're, you know, they're not all the same, neither are people with disabilities. I will say one encouraging factor here is very often when you design for one disability, for example, uh, individuals who are blind, uh, we pretty much every single website, application, app that we test, we use screen readers and that is a once once you've made it accessible for screen reader users you've you've pretty much gotten 90 percent or more of of what you need to do to make it accessible for other populations as well so it sounds like a daunting task initially but it can actually be a very stimulating and rewarding path to go down pulling people in with disabilities and i can guarantee you they're going to be teaching you a lot about things that you may have just taken for granted, unless you've had a lot of exposure to people with disabilities. So a quote from a name you'll recognize. I'm, I'm not gonna tell you immediately who this is. Um, we do not need pity, nor do we need to be reminded that we are vulnerable. We must be treated as equals and communication is a way we can bring this about. This, this could very well be a, um, civil rights statement, couldn't it? So this was written by Louis Braille, who designed the Braille Code. He lived from 1809 to 1852. And he had this, his Braille Code was actually adapted for use in languages worldwide. And it was not only until, it was, it was not until long after his death that his uh, Braille Code was actually uh, incorporated and just like so many people that are way ahead of their time, it, it, it took the rest of society some time to, to digest how powerful the, the Braille code was. And even to this day, you have all these screen readers that can speak to you. There's a lot of, lot of statistics out there showing that individuals who are blind, 
who are successful uh, Braille users. And you can have refreshable Braille displays. It doesn't just have to be the traditional paper copies. Um, but people, people who are successful with, with Braille uh, are very often successful in other areas just because of that, that, that access. So thank you all for your time. And Elizabeth is going to flag any questions that come up. We're at uh, 1.50 now. I know some of you are scheduled to uh, attend a uh, session at two o'clock, but uh, Elizabeth, if you can read any of the questions that came up, we'll do our best to address them. John, so far there are no questions, so this will be a, uh, okay, we have one that just came in. Could you share some examples of websites which you consider really good from an accessibility point of view? That's from Linda Jansova. Sure. Um, that's that's a great question, and it's one that I get a lot, actually. Um, it, like I said earlier, there is no, there's rarely a website that's 100% accessible at all times, but the World Wide Web Consortium has a very effective before and after website, one that's uh, uh, inaccessible, and then it's created accessible. So if you Google W3C, and then hyphen way, W-A-Y, that stands for the Web Accessibility Initiative, and type in accessible website, you should be able to, in very short order, pull up that, that, um, th uh, that before and after website. So that's a really good example of, of looking at a website. And honestly, if you're just looking at it visually, you're not going to see a lot of differences. Uh, if you're a developer and you're looking at the code, you're definitely going to. The real impact is if you use a screen reader on the before and after, that's that's where the rubber hits the pavement. You'll see a huge difference. Okay, and then the next question is from Jane Sandberg. What are some good ways to establish a culture of accessibility in an informal, non-hierarchical community like the Evergreen community? Wow. Boy, good question. Um, what I would uh, first step, and, and Elizabeth is a good example of this, is is reach out to those uh, you know disability communities, establish a personal relationship with uh, individuals with disabilities, establish that rapport, but more importantly, hire people with disabilities. There's a lot of really highly qualified people with disabilities. And, um, you know, if, if we're going to practice what we preach, you know, our, our procurement process, our hiring process, including uh, human resources, um, you know, actively looking for people with disabilities to contribute to your organization. And you'll find that it's, it goes way beyond just the accessibility of a website or application you're going to find that your documents that you generate are going to be more accessible. Your public meetings that you have in, in uh, conference rooms, they're going to give you a lot of feedback. And it's, you know, it's, it's a paradigm shift that you can't, you can't just emulate uh, or read about. Um, that being said, I realize that that's not always ideal um, for different organizations. Um, you know, it's uh, very highly specialized skills and there, there may not be candidates uh, that are even applying with disabilities. And that's why I, t for starters, reach out to those disability communities and start establishing those relationships. Okay, um, I don't see any more questions. There was a lot of discussion, John, about uh, old websites, a lot of reminiscing about those, and then lots of thank you, John, and then uh, Andrea says, thank you, John, lots of great advice, especially about starting with accessibility. Excellent. Well, thank you all, and uh, thank you to Elizabeth. Um, this has been an honor to be the keynote speaker, and I hope the rest of the conference goes well. Again, I, I thank the Evergreen community for all the work that they've put into this to transition this from uh, an on-site to online experience. It's uh, not, a, not a light task by any means. So thank you. And with that, I'll go ahead and close it out. Thanks so much.